You think so? I can imagine. Well, you didn't put anything in here, did you know? Anyway, so you know what's irritating about this as you open this, no the strap goes into it. Oh, no, that's it then. So then you have to walk around the side to pull the strap out of the way. Out of the way, and then close it and then you have to walk back around. Yeah. Grab the strap. Pull shut. All right. Yeah. That's a lot. Right, well you're. You're shutting it now, or we're driving. Taking a look in here because, you know, we've, we've, we are Maverick for over a year now. I'm trying to think, first of all, this kills the usability of this bag. Yes. Think of all the things I've put in a Maverick and sent photos to you of couches, motorcycles. Well, those are many things. Great ways to start. I would not have been able to fit the motorcycles in here because they go up, up to the front of the bag. Yeah. And we lose like that's over a foot. Yeah. And then couches. Yeah. Same thing. I mean, I've really utilized the whole thing and even these little bits take up usable. Yeah. They look cooler. They do look cool. Um, and I know the kind of the intended shoppers are different between this and the Maverick, and you could probably I don't know if you could remove this. I'm sure you could remove that you will share, but like, easily. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Probably not the little adjustable things I could. I can definitely see myself using those. I do wonder though, I think of like, oh, this was boots. Um, that. Yeah, they'd fit and this would be a nice little thing to have. Just a little under storage. Well, this is kind of like a ridgeline. Yeah, that was thinking about that with it says under here, there's a warning that says don't use it for beverages, but it's got a drink. This is a good short out the electronics. Pretty sure. Check it out. Yeah. Yes. Oh, to the latch area. Well, you have to assume that water is going to splash up on the latch causing failures, huh? Yeah, the electronic latch. Yeah. Maybe they mean, like, power washing and or something. That could be. Yeah, it probably happened to, like, two people on the 2022 models, and so they put that thing myself. I couldn't be, you know, thank you for assisting. It's a two-person job to close that. Yeah. I like the soft closed tailgate. Soft, open, soft, open. It's not soft. Close. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on. My brother with the truck, and we'll talk about it more here from inside. But is this is a car that people buy more? So to use the front end, occasionally use the band Maverick is a little bit more 5050 like yeah, I could see that because you plan on having a bed in for use. Yeah. Oh yes. Sorry. Would you like to close it? Well, because I can do the honors. It's very graceful. Okay. Would you like to drive? Yeah. Yeah. Not a ton of sidewall on these giant wheels. No, I think they're toes. Pretty sure. Small pet peeve. I like all the dust on here. Well, yes, that I. Oh, come on. Is that why you wear hoodies all the time? Easier to clean off screen. Yeah. My, my material wouldn't have done that anyway. A remote started this over the weekend and things I remote started this over the weekend and when you remote start it there's no confirmation, there's no like lights that come on to let you know that it's the starting has worked it flashes three times but then stays blank a lot of cars the DRLS. Come on. You can go. Oh good it's start good. It's running. Yeah, I have no idea. Why do the Koreans struggle with that so much? With the remote start not only starting, but also giving you a sign that it has started. Right? And I don't know. I don't know. Also, I was blinded last night because we had to drive in the evening and it was a very bright. I had it turned all the way down to the white gauges. Yeah. And no eco mode. Oh. So you have to either drive in sport or look at the white base gauges. CarPlay works pretty well, although again, small pet peeve that it doesn't, by default, bring it up because you get in the car, you plug your device in, or you use one of the wireless CarPlay adapters that we've promoted on the channel. 
And then it says reading USB and now CarPlay is connected. But you it doesn't like I still have to go over here and click it. But why doesn't it just come up? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Because you would think if you're plugging CarPlay and you probably would probably want CarPlay. Yeah, that's true. Also, I'm not a huge fan of the haptics for for adjusting the time because you have to like it. You have to look at them and do it in a lot of vehicles. You can just get in and kind of like mindlessly rotate things. Another thing, if you do a remote start, the truck that if you do remote start the truck, it defaults and you maybe you can change this, but it defaults climate control, the 72 auto. I noticed that it was a little bit haunted when I got it because it would just do whatever it wanted to do. I was like, why does the climate control keep changing? And I'm not asking it to do that. There's got to be a way to probably make it not do that. Like there was something else irritating with this. The problem is it's been like four days since I've driven it, so I don't remember what I was irritated with the tuning the throttle, tuning with the DCT. Not the smoothest thing in the world, sure. But it could also be because of the turbo lag. Well, let's explain this to the viewers a little bit. Who maybe not aren't aren't quite as technically minded this truck as opposed to many other vehicles for its transmission uses a mechanism or where two physical clutches have to come together and meet and marry in order to propel the car forward similar to that of a manual transmission as opposed to most automatics which use a viscous fluid in order to be able to stop it. It's a vicious, vicious meaning. It's thick like peanut butter and a torque converter, like a warm peanut butter. Yes. And the torque converter to propel the car forward and those torque converter automatics do lose a little bit in fuel efficiency, but they make up for it in the smoothness. And this car actually has to use a wet clutch to to meet together. And sometimes that results in jerkiness. Sometimes, as Chris mentioned, it results in not very smooth satellite application. But also I really do genuinely worry about the longevity of this transmission. Yeah, well, we've seen that when they got trouble with hundreds had trouble, Ford had trouble when they were doing it. We just talked about this in the Mazda 690, how no one ever really has issues with the torque converter automatics. But manufacturers always have issues when they try to go for a dual clutch automatic. It's just like I was at a stoplight yesterday next to a third generation Ford Focus, and I almost sent you a photo saying, what are these two cars having? Yeah, and then we'll need a transmission in a hundred. That's right. Yeah. And I think even even more so with a vehicle like this, trucks are something that you often do stop and go type of things with. Oh yeah. For example, I pulled a tree out with my Maverick Ford and that is something that in this smoke, the clutch. Yeah, the clutch would just be like burning up, having to try to go from a stop and yanking out that tree. Yeah, well, the Maverick, it's just moving the torque converter there. No harm, no foul. Yeah. So doing towing off-roading, pulling of trees, nudging yourself back to a trailer or something like that, or to a loading round, that's a lot of work. I mean, there's just a lot of things that I don't want the idea of doing with the dual clutch. Well, like you said earlier, this Santa Cruz is more aimed towards people that are going to only occasionally use the back. The front is the priority. So at least in that respect, yes, it probably won't suffer as much from all the things that you just listed. Also, if I got one of these, I would get a trans tune and make it at least shift fast and fart, because then you'd have some sort of value to having a dual clutch. You would want a Santa Cruz, and yes, yes, you'd be Santa Cruz. I'd have an exhaust, a tune, a downpipe and a trans tune, and it would be like and I'd get some seats from an Elantra, and I'm going to choose not to throw this thing around like an absolute moonwagon. Why, because it handles great. I believe you. But as we've discussed. Okay. And you're still going. Yeah, well, this is casual, but so it does drive this. I'm not going to throw it around, but most people aren't going to drive the truck. No, no. I do remember going on the first drive of this in Santa Cruz and my goodness was I was thinking, why does Hyundai name all of their vehicles off after places like here over the two? It's kind of that Korean thing where like they're like, oh, well, what what's a nice American thing? It's like, oh, let's just go through the list of like deserts. Santa Cruz, Santa Fe, Tucson, Telluride, Kona Palisade, may be a place. Palisade Mountains. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So many, many. Yeah. What the Santa Cruz does really well is refinement. I will say being in here is a nice place to be. There's comforts, the wish, the ergonomics are really good. 
You can just kind of have your hand showing on this cool wheel. The shifter works well back and forth. This, even though somewhat of an annoying it still gets the volume on the lower and lower trim cars I think you still get about. Yeah unless this car like yeah we're going to hit this at 45 and it's going to take it pretty darn well even with these bigger wheels. I would love to drive a more basic spec Santa Cruz because I feel like that would do better and a lot of truck sort of things. Well that's quite common on that. There. The gauge cluster is a nice view. I think it looks like some here. Well, the steering is a good week. It's not too late to feel insignificant, but it's not too heavy to be cumbersome. Yeah, the way that I kind of put it in my intro is pretty much what you just said, where the advantage of this over the Maverick is. It does just feel like a step above in all trims, whereas you get the Maverick if you want to do more utility-style things. But this is something that you could really take on a long trip and use every day and be quite comfortable. Not to say that Maverick isn't. This is just next level because it's a little bit more expensive and the materials are a little bit, a little bit nicer feeling. I think the Maverick is a more unique interior and more unique truck overall. Yeah, but but no, I mean, the Maverick's not nearly as comfortable. Yeah, and a lot of people complain about the cheapness of the Maverick where it's not the case with this one. You know what? This does have roof rails. Maverick does not. Oh, interesting. Can you not add them to the Maverick? You can. You can. Yeah. This more has the heart of a Subaru Baja. Whereas the Maverick has the heart of a first-gen Ranger. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other thing and furthering what you just said before we took our silly thumbnail, you know how the Honda Ridgeline is excellent, but very few people buy them. You're going to do a very Charlie sort of thing here. Testing out the right undulation. Yeah. Again, you know how the Ridgeline is like the type of truck that we love. But not many people buy them. But the people who do buy them really do quite like them and it fits their life. Yes, I think this is the same concept for a smaller truck. Many more people are buying the Maverick. Anything that makes sense because the Maverick is a more practical body. But there are there's a narrower subset of more affluent buyers who will prefer this truck over the Maverick and I do think fits them better. Yes. But I think this has a there are fewer people who would be. But I think the Maverick is a great truck. And I know this is practically turning into another compare, which we've already done. Yeah, we have done the trucks, but I recommend the Maverick to people who might not even be interested in a truck just because it's so inexpensive. Not really the case. But this one, this should be like, does your lifestyle fit A, B, C, and D? Okay, then I guess a Santa Cruz would be a good choice for you, right? Alright, dude, it's so quick and feels like it would like, keep up with my M Roadster. I was going to make that joke. Yeah, you're driving. Seriously, this would probably be true. Oh, it certainly would. From 060. Cause shift shifter. So blown out in the Roadster. You're searching for gears the whole time. But yeah, this is like impressive levels of torque. It's got over 300 pound-feet of torque. So, yeah. And you figure this powertrain is shared with the Sonata N-Line. So I would know about that car because I got a ticket in that car. Yeah, it's all-wheel drive. That's right. Yeah, I know. This is the most practical form of that powertrain because it's pretty unusable in the Sonata N-Line. It could just be whatever junky tires they put on that thing. Are you having fun with the console? You don't know. It just feels good. Take the racing line at this apex. I think you. I'm going to leave this part in as no. Charlie just said something offensive and I had to cut it out. It's objectively true. Okay? I didn't say anything bad about them. Okay, I'm going to beat this. People are going to say, you got 300 pound feet of torque. Yeah, I oh, yeah. I feel like they put better tires on this, and they did on that. This thing handled one race. Yeah, it's yeah, it's fun to drive. Yeah. I mean it's a good track. How much does it cost? Oh yeah. No, it's tricky. Yeah, that's not too much. Crazy. 4142 people are spending a lot of money on cars. These days. 
Yeah. Would you have this or a Maverick Tremor Lariat? Kurt Tremor, Larry. Something like 37. I know. Yeah. So you'd have that because then you could also do all of your, all of your Charlie things with it. Yeah. We're going to have to use a different level. We'll go to this one. Yeah, I mean, I, I know there are a lot of people who, especially if you lease cars or whatever, it doesn't matter. But I would be genuinely concerned about owning this and doing the things I do with the dual clutch. Yeah, I really, I really would be. So I'd get them every, um. The tremor rides better. Yeah. This is a nicer place to be. I, I think I'd have this for uniqueness, cause you never really see these and it's, it's just kind of a cool factor thing. And either way, you see Mavericks, though, you don't see Santa Cruz at all. I see these more when we're out west, right? These are more of the lifestyle of beach people. Well, let's take a couple surfboards back there. That's all right. Yeah, it's cool. They at the launch event, they took videos for the launch event with some famous surfer. Might have been Kelly Slater, but I don't know who is who is like, I really like the Santa Cruz, and I can do all my surfing thing and go hang out with my friends at the beach. I'm like, okay, you know, PR stuff. Um, you could just buy a 9, 8, 7 Caymanus because it comes with places to screw in a roof rack, that would be better. And then you could put surfboards on that, although you would probably have a small aneurysm if anyone got a grain of sand in your car. That's true, but you could just buy another, not mine. You need to buy a 47. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're interested in the Santa Cruz, buy a 9, 8, 7 Caymanus. And that's right, because it's about the same price. Yeah, well, it's actually cheaper. Cheaper, like 10 grand. And the transmission will last longer. Yes. And that's daily motor, and that's the 23 Hyundai Santa Cruz. I'm going a different color to it. I was just going to say that I kind of like this gray, because it's got some cool, it's got some cool flake. I agree that I would get a different color, but I don't mind this. Gray, yeah, it's just boring. It is bland. I wish you could have this in yellow. I would be sick if you could get yellow. What's the type of truck that like? It needs to be amped up a bit by the colors again. That's what matters. Yeah, well, it's a bunch of cool colors on it. Get a Santa Cruz, wrap it yellow, put an engine and trans tune on it, put it down, pipe on it. Bigger tires, bigger tires, lift it up slightly and I say down, pipe and dump. Okay, well, whatever. Make it fart and make it tall and make it yellow. That's what I would do. All right. Well, all those things would make the Santa Cruz the best fuel. That's right. Uh, anything else useful? I feel like there's something else I want to say, but it's... It's... It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, are we Paris and Nicole? Yeah, I think we're a, or we're person too cool for this truck. Okay. All right, everyone. Well, thank you all so much for watching. 2023 Mercedes-Benz GLC 300 formatage. As goes the Mercedes-Benz C-Class, so goes its sport utility sibling, the GLC Class. Benz's compact executive sedan received a comprehensive makeover for 2022, adding a 48-volt mild hybrid system to the powertrain and overhauling the looks, the cabin, and the tech therein. Now, it's the GLC's turn, and while the 2023 GLC 300 may not look all that different from the outside, it's grown a bit and picked up some notably nicer accoutrements. The 2023 GLC 300 hides its newly envisioned dimensions well in pictures, but it does appear portlier in person. With the wheelbase unchanged at 113.1 inches, and length expanding 2.4 inches to 185.7 inches, all that growth goes right to overhang, an observation our bathroom mirrors are all too familiar with. Luggage capacity is up by nearly 3 cubic feet, to 22 total. Since the wheelbase is unchanged, it shouldn't come as a surprise that front and rear legroom change by just 0.1 inch, the front shorter, rear longer, and feel no different in the new model. A few other dimensions have been massaged to boost aerodynamic slip. The GLC 300's drag coefficient now measures 0.29, an improvement of two hundredths over the outgoing model. Overall height is down a tenth of an inch, the front track grows by 0.3 inch, and the rear track is nearly a full inch wider than before. Weight is up a fair bit, 
to £4,406 versus the £4,122 we measured in a 2020 model. Whether it's purchased with rear or all-wheel drive, a $2,000 upcharge, the GLC 300 is now a 48-volt mild hybrid. The integrated starter generator bolts up to a turbocharged 2.0-liter inline-4, producing the same 255 horsepower as before, but torque rises 22 pound-feet to 295. The electric motor can add up to 23 horsepower and 148 pound-feet, but not at peak. That motive force gets routed to the wheels by way of a smooth-shifting 9-speed automatic transmission. With nearly 300 additional pounds of mass being shoved around and only 22 extra pound-feet on tap, the 2023 GLC 300's acceleration suffers, but not by much. The GLC 300 reaches 60 miles per hour in 5.7 seconds, 0.3 second behind the 2020 model. The story is similar in the quarter, with the 2023 model crossing the line in 14.4 seconds at 95 miles per hour, a negligible difference to the 2020's 14.2 second run at 96 miles per hour. These numbers remain superior to the last BMW X330i we tested, and they're about even with the Audi Q545. Some of this comes from the tires, which on the 2020 model had 235 divided by 55 are minus 19 Pirelli Scorpion Verde. All season run flats at all four corners, our 2023 example wears wider, staggered AMG wheels, $850, and rolls on 20-inch Continental Eco Contact 6 summer rubber measuring 255. 45 up front and a whopping 285 or 40 in the rear. That Rubenesque contact patch certainly helps explain our improved skid pad figure of 0.88g, besting the old GLC's 0.85g, not that impressive, though, when accounting for the transition from all season to summer tires. Mercedes's tweaks to the 2023 GLC Formula Boost EPA estimated highway economy to 31 miles per gallon, 3 miles per gallon more than the outgoing model. The GLC 300's newfound electrification also sweetens the SUV's on-road demeanor. This stop-start is among the smoothest on the market, reviving the gas engine with nary a shudder. Under deceleration, it's difficult to notice when the engine shuts off for low-speed coasting. This smoothness extends to the steering, banefully so, as it's devoid of off-center buildup and is just numb all around, and the brakes, which are easy to modulate for consistently smooth stops. The remaining parts of the Merck's driving experience would be best summed up as sport adjacent. The GLC's standard adaptive dampers keep things nice and smooth over mildly uneven parts of the roadway, and body motions are well controlled, but more dramatic humps and bumps transfer a good bit of motion inside. If we were ordering our own GLC 300, we'd stick with the standard 18 inch wheels, with tires that have thicker sidewalls and should deliver a better ride on Michigan's Martian roadscape. Chuck the GLC into a corner and, sure, it'll lean more than a C-Class, but it stays well sorted and makes a good case for taking the long way back from school drop-off. The four-banger sounds pretty good when you give it the beans too. It's a damn shame about that steering considering how well sorted the rest of this car is. If your commute has more traffic lights than curves, you're in luck, because now you can appreciate just how much better the GLC 300's interior is. The waterfall-like center console shape remains, but the rest has been revamped to match the style found in other Mercedes vehicles, and it works well. Our sample GLC's dashboard was covered in natural grain blackwood with aluminum strips, $200. The steering wheel has been upgraded with a sharper design, but fans of physical buttons will find very few anywhere inside, a point of occasional frustration, as the capacitive directional pads on the steering wheel spokes are way too easy to activate by accident. The panoramic roof, $1,500, features a thinner cross strut too, not that anyone would notice. Do you love screens? Well, the GLC is a modern Mercedes, so you'd better. The old model's deep gauge binnacle has been trashed in favor of a 12.3-inch display with multiple layouts, and the capability to display a full navigation map. The 11.9-inch standard center touchscreen runs the latest iteration of MBUX infotainment software which is responsive, sufficiently easy to navigate, and includes wireless smartphone mirroring. The center display will pick up, and reflect, greasy fingerprints like nobody's business, so take your preschool instruction to heart and wash your hands often. While the GLC 300 format its $50,250 base price is in line with the segment, things can get expensive in a hurry. We're staring down an as-tested price of $65,950. Some of that comes from the top pinnacle trim's $4,450 price bump, but standalone options sure aren't cheap either. 
more aggressive AMG line styling will set you back $3,450, although the night package's blacked out trim only adds $200 to the bottom line. The driver assistance package contains all the usual active and passive driver aids for an extra $1,950, even this specific shade of cardinal red metallic is a hefty $1,750. Despite the bit of sticker shock, the 2023 Mercedes-Benz GLC 304 Matic is a strong contender in the Entrelux department. Its cabin is vastly improved over its predecessors, while its new hybrid components add a dollop of smoothness to around town duties. Yet it still can let loose and have a little fun, even with the extra junk in the trunk. Cars are Andrew Crock's jam, along with Borisenbury. After graduating with a degree in English from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2009, Andrew cut his teeth writing freelance magazine features, and now he has a decade of full-time review experience under his belt. A Chicagone by birth, he has been a Detroit resident since 2015. Maybe one day he'll do something about that half-finished engineering degree. 2024 Lamborghini Huracan Storato exits in a cloud of dust. Off-roading in a Lamborghini Huracan isn't anything new to us. We've mowed the lawn at triple-digit speeds through Virginia International Raceway's daunting uphill S's. On another occasion, we ended up behind the guardrail and in the woods of VIR's Patriot course. Don't ask. Those excursions occurred involuntarily. The thought of willingly exiting the tarmac and throwing a hurricane into the dirt is insane. But nothing about the dual-purpose Lamborghini Huracan Storato is rational. What makes the Huracan Storato special? Just look at the thing's bulging fenders, the rally-inspired light pods grafted onto its angular nose, the roof-mounted snorkel and optional luggage rack, and the oddest-looking tires to be fitted to a Huracan. It's clear this is not a typical supercar. The Storato is part Bruce Wayne, but mostly Max Rokotansky. A little touch of class, but all badass, this is the first Lamborghini since the LM002 to wear dirt well. The Storato isn't a byproduct of Porsche transforming the 911 into an off-road buggy with the Dakar. Lamborghini's concept dates back to 2017, when the engineering team, hot on the heels of working on the Euros, realized there was more left in the LP610-4 all-wheel drive platform. Why not fit it with longer electronically controlled dampers and softer springs to provide 1.7 inches more ground clearance, than the Evo and softer anti-roll bars to enable more articulation? If you build it, they will come. And they came in droves. The Storato became instantly popular before anyone had driven one. The number that Lamborghini would produce increased again and again, finally reaching 1499, all quickly spoken for despite a $278,972 sticker. It was the end of the Huracan's journey. As in all Hurons that came before it, the heart and soul of the Storato remains the enthralling 5.2 litre V10, which has a furious soundtrack as 10 pistons pump and 40 titanium valves suck and blow air. In the Storato, the V10 generates 602 horsepower down 29 horses from the same engine in the previous STO and Technica variants. Until now, Hurons have drawn air into the intakes from openings ahead of the rear wheels. To no surprise, when you're kicking up dust and dirt, low air intakes are a terrible idea. Lamborghini's fix is the rooftop snorkel, previously used on the STO to move air through the engine bay and here serving as the Storato's windpipe. Its flow path is more restrictive, resulting in the reduction of horsepower. Driving the Huracan Storato. Sure, the Storato has enhanced approach, breakover, and departure angles, but none of that matters much at Chukwala Valley Raceway. The off road wedge obliterates the front straight. Stand on the firm, if a bit sensitive, brake pedal that modulates the standard carbon ceramic brakes, and the Storato, fitted with Bridgestone all terrain tires, more on those later, twerks its way into turn one. The tires beg for mercy under load exiting turn 3, and sport mode allows a copious amount of sideways playfulness. On this day, we'll ignore turning down into turn 4 and instead flip the steering wheel toggle to rally mode and drive off into the sunbaked desert. Willingly plowing the Storato into the sand feels unnatural, but with a left-right twist of the fuzzy steering wheel, the quick, fixed-ratio steering rack is an all-star for setting up a Scandinavian flick. For this model, Lamborghini passed on rear axle steering as it muddied the vehicle dynamics when paired with the all-terrain tires. Even without it, the brake-based torque vectoring pivots the machine, the earth succumbs, dirt encompasses the six-figure rally car, and with a pull of the big column-mounted shift paddles, the seven-speed dual-clutch automatic snaps off a gear change, the Haldex all-wheel drive system shuffles torque between axles, and the Storato exits, 
leaving a dust plume reminiscent of the road runner. Never had the thought of piloting a hurricane over lumpy terrain in third gear on an 8,500 rpm redline occurred to us, but the softer dampers and spring rates, paired with longer and squishier internal bump stops, keep the uprights from ejecting from the chassis. Find the right, or maybe the wrong, path through the desert and you'll use all 6.4 inches of ground clearance. Dirt will fly over the hood. This isn't the stuff trophy trucks are made of, but for a pavement pounder, it's impressive and hilariously fun. None of this would be possible without the right tires. For that, Lamborghini tasked Bridgestone to develop the Dueler All-Terrain AT002, an all-terrain tire rated at 168 miles per hour and available only in a Storato fitment. The sidewall construction mimics that of a Bridgestone Potenza Sport summer tire, so it's stiff. Aside from a tread pattern meant to evacuate rocks and mud, the Dueler features interlocking snipes and tie bars to lock the tread blocks together to provide more stability under load. And it's a run flat, so in the event of a puncture, the Storato can carry on for 50 miles at 50 miles per hour. And while some might be tempted to mount two spares on the roof rack, it's only rated for 88 pounds. Bridgestone will also offer a one-off winter tire for the Storato. Oh, the possibilities. It's not just for off-road. The Storato's off-road capabilities aside, Lamborghini has created quite possibly the best road-going Huracan to date. Its softness makes for an enjoyable ride on the interstate, and with little roar from the all-terrain tires, this is the Huracan you'd want to drive across the country. Attack mountain switchbacks and there's more pitch and roll than any Huracan before it, and the steering is so quick and light that mid-corner corrections frequently occur until you train your hands to slow down. But none of this dulls the experience. Lean on it nice and hard, and the bridge stones deliver what will likely be the greatest amount of grip we've measured from all-terrain rubber. And those fender flares aren't just for looks. The front and rear tracks have been widened by the 1st of February and the 1st of March inches, respectively, giving the Storato a touch more sure-footedness, other than a digital inclinometer, a pitch and roll display, and GPS coordinates in the central display, the Storato's interior is much the same as any other Hurricanes. Perhaps one of the coolest features is its ability to sync an Apple Watch and record your heartbeat. And your heart may skip a beat driving the Storato. Even more so than all the Huracan variants that preceded it, this Lamborghini is one wild ride. 2024 Audi Q8 e-tron and Q8 e-tron Sportback go farther, quietly. The Audi Q8 e-tron and its smoothback sibling, the Q8 e-tron Sportback, enter 2024 with a new name, more range, more efficient batteries, better aerodynamics, and faster charging. The mechanical changes address customer concerns about range and performance, while the name change, from just plain e-tron to Q8 e-tron, is to give buyers a better sense of where the big two-row SUV sits in the brand's lineup of EV and ICE offerings. Like the gas-powered Q8, the Q8 e-tron sits at the top of the range, a roomy cruiser ready for glamorous day trips or making day-to-day -day errands feel glamorous. The base model starts at $75,595, and the Sportback Launch Edition we drove, with the dark chrome S-line trim and orange-piped leather interior, rings in at $95,395 with options. Q8 e-tron range and charging times. The dark chrome and orange details are hints that the Q8 e-tron is a luxury SUV with a touch of sporty flair. It gets a bit more flair for 2024 with both a redesigned grille and headlights that highlight its slightly wider body. The styling changes also reduce drag, achieved through new wheel designs, shutters in the nose that can open for cooling and close for smooth sailing, and bodywork around the wheel wells that channels the wind. The wind cheating helps the 2024 Q8 e-tron get better range than the 2023 e-tron an EPA estimated 285 miles for the standard version and 296 miles for the Sportback, 300 miles with the optional Ultra package, up from 225 to 226 miles before. The improved aerodynamics also let the air also pass by with barely a whisper of wind noise, even on the highway. The Audi's improved efficiency isn't just from the aero updates. The Q8 uses two motors, and for 2024, the rear motor gets extra windings that allow it to create a stronger magnetic field from the same incoming electricity. The result is more torque and reduced energy consumption. Couple that with a higher capacity battery, 106.0 kWh compared to the outgoing 86.5 kWh pack, and you get more range, recharging times have also improved. The 2024 Q8 can now take in 170 kW, 
up from 150 kilowatts, at a DC faster charger and should be able to go from an almost empty 10% battery to a back in action 80% in around 31 minutes, according to Audi. For level 2 home charging, the standard 9.6 kilowatt charger will refill the battery overnight, in about 13 hours, while an optional 19.2 kilowatt setup, an $1850 upgrade, can do it in half that time, driving the Q8 e-tron. We have to admit we weren't doing charging math while behind the wheel of the Q8 e-tron. In fact, we were somewhat startled to look down after a glorious run through the dappled light of a northern California redwood forest and realize we had about 40 miles of range left. It's easy to lose track of how far you've gone because the Q8 is so pleasant to drive. It's quick, with a combined 402 horses from its two motors, but not neck-snappingly so. From a stoplight, a foot to the floor would get you to 60 miles per hour in 5.4 seconds, according to Audi, which is middling acceleration by EV standards. And yet it strikes us as just the right amount of power for an SUV of this size, not so fast that you're backing off in a panic if you get a little heavy shoed, but plenty torquey enough to power out of curves and confidently merge into fast-moving traffic. Changes to the Q8 e-tron steering and suspension improve the driving experience. A quicker ratio of 14.6 to 1 instead of the previous 15.8 to 1 results in a more responsive wheel. The front suspension gets a stiffer bushings, and the adaptive air springs, which offer 3.0 inches of height adjustment, soak up bumps and ruts with aplomb. Along with the suspension settings, the Q8 offers seven different drive modes, which alter ride height, accelerator response, steering feel, stability control programming, and power delivery. Brake energy regen can be adjusted via paddles on the steering wheel, and the most aggressive setting will just about bring the car to a complete stop. The brake feel is fantastic, with no grabby spots in the pedal travel as the Q8 transitions from regen to friction braking. As is often the case on California's Highway 1, we had to stop several times due to road construction. In the Q8 e-tron Prestige, with its massaging seats, the delay afforded the opportunity to kick back and admire the drifting coastal fog as it floated gently over the panoramic glass roof. Well, during the second stop, we were able to do this. The first one was spent delving through the extensive menus in the 10.1-inch upper display screen to figure out how to turn off the various lane-keeping beeps. For the record, it's in both the settings menu and on the end of the turn signal stalk. The Q8 is screen-heavy, with a second display for climate controls below the main infotainment screen. There's also screen-based instrumentation, and in the prestige trim we drove, a head-up display. The Q8's interior is much like the exterior, with a design that could be more radical but certainly won't upset anyone. The center console layout doesn't make the best use of space for storage, with cup holders crammed up against the shifter and the vertical phone slot but there is a left side drawer in the dash that's perfect for parking garage tickets and secret snacks. Human space is excellent, the seats are comfortable both front and rear even in the sloped roof sport back. Electric vehicles and SUVs lend themselves to comfort and luxury. Audi was wise to recognize that and not attempt to make the Q8 too focused on handling or acceleration. The improved range means less worry about recharging, allowing drivers to relax and enjoy the smooth, quiet ride. 2024 Audi Q8 e-tron and Q8 e-tron Sportback go farther, quietly. The Audi Q8 e-tron and its smooth-backed sibling, the Q8 e-tron Sportback, enter 2024 with a new name, more range, more efficient batteries, better aerodynamics, and faster charging. The mechanical changes address customer concerns about range and performance, while the name change, from just plain e-tron to Q8 e-tron, is to give buyers a better sense of where the big two-row SUV sits in the brand's lineup of EV and ICE offerings. Like the gas-powered Q8, the Q8 e-tron sits at the top of the range, a roomy cruiser ready for glamorous day trips or making day-to-day -day errands feel glamorous. The base model starts at $75,595, and the Sportback launch edition we drove, with the dark chrome S-line trim and orange-piped leather interior, rings in at $95,395 with options. Q8 e-tron range and charging times. The dark chrome and orange details are hints that the Q8 e-tron is a luxury SUV with a touch of sporty flair. It gets a bit more flair for 2024 with both a redesigned grille and headlights that highlight its slightly wider body. The styling changes also reduce drag, 
achieved through new wheel designs, shutters in the nose that can open for cooling and close for smooth sailing, and bodywork around the wheel wells that channels the wind. The wind cheating helps the 2024 Q8 e-tron get better range than the 2023 e-tron, an EPA estimated 285 miles for the standard version and 296 miles for the sportback, 300 miles with the optional ultra package, up from 225 to 226 miles before. The improved aerodynamics also let the air also pass by with barely a whisper of wind noise, even on the highway. The Audi's improved efficiency isn't just from the aero updates. The Q8 uses two motors, and for 2024, the rear motor gets extra windings that allow it to create a stronger magnetic field from the same incoming electricity. The result is more torque and reduced energy consumption. Couple that with a higher capacity battery, 106.0 kWh compared to the outgoing 86.5 kWh pack, and you get more range, recharging times have also improved. The 2024 Q8 can now take in 170 kilowatts, up from 150 kilowatts, at a DC faster charger and should be able to go from an almost empty 10% battery to a back in action 80% in around 31 minutes, according to Audi. For level 2 home charging, the standard 9.6 kilowatt charger will refill the battery overnight, in about 13 hours, while an optional 19.2 kilowatt setup, an $1850 upgrade, can do it in half that time, driving the Q8 e-tron. We have to admit we weren't doing charging math while behind the wheel of the Q8 e-tron. In fact, we were somewhat startled to look down after a glorious run through the dappled light of a northern California redwood forest and realize we had about 40 miles of range left. It's easy to lose track of how far you've gone because the Q8 is so pleasant to drive. It's quick, with a combined 402 horses from its two motors, but not neck snappingly so. From a stoplight, a foot to the floor would get you to 60 miles per hour in 5.4 seconds, according to Audi, which is middling acceleration by EV standards. And yet it strikes us as just the right amount of power for an SUV of this size, not so fast that you're backing off in a panic if you get a little heavy shoed, but plenty talky enough to power out of curves and confidently merge into fast moving traffic. Changes to the Q8 e-tron steering and suspension improve the driving experience. A quicker ratio of 14.6 to 1 instead of the previous 15.8 to 1 results in a more responsive wheel. The front suspension gets a stiffer bushings, and the adaptive air springs, which offer 3.0 inches of height adjustment, soak up bumps and ruts with aplomb. Along with the suspension settings, the Q8 offers seven different drive modes, which alter ride height, accelerator response, steering feel, stability control programming, and power delivery. Brake energy regen can be adjusted via paddles on the steering wheel, and the most aggressive setting will just about bring the car to a complete stop. The brake feel is fantastic, with no grabby spots in the pedal travel as the Q8 transitions from regen to friction braking. As is often the case on California's Highway 1, we had to stop several times due to road construction. In the Q8 e-tron Prestige, with its massaging seats, the delay afforded the opportunity to kick back and admire the drifting coastal fog as it floated gently over the panoramic glass roof. Well, during the second stop, we were able to do this. The first one was spent delving through the extensive menus in the 10.1-inch upper display screen to figure out how to turn off the various lane-keeping beeps. For the record, it's in both the settings menu and on the end of the turn signal stalk. The Q8 is screen-heavy, with a second display for climate controls below the main infotainment screen. There's also screen-based instrumentation, and in the prestige trim we drove, a head-up display. The Q8's interior is much like the exterior, with a design that could be more radical but certainly won't upset anyone. The center console layout doesn't make the best use of space for storage, with cup holders crammed up against the shifter and the vertical phone slot but there is a left side drawer in the dash that's perfect for parking garage tickets and secret snacks. Human space is excellent, the seats are comfortable both front and rear even in the sloped roof sportback. Electric vehicles and SUVs lend themselves to comfort and luxury. Audi was wise to recognize that and not attempt to make the Q8 too focused on handling or acceleration. The improved range means less worry about recharging, allowing drivers to relax and enjoy the smooth, quiet ride.
Beneath the purple skin specific to this commemorative edition 50 jar that celebrates a half century of BMW's M division, and shared by all M3 competition models, is a stonking 503 horsepower twin turbo 3.0 liter inline 6. With launch control engaged and the boost holding above 15.0 psi, the quickest ever 3 series leaps to 30 miles per hour in 1 second. The scoot to 60 miles per hour takes 2.8 seconds, and the quarter mile passes in 11.0 seconds at 124 miles per hour. All wheel drive comes standard on the Edition 50 jar and can be had on any other M3 comp for $4,000. It adds roughly 150 pounds to the curb weight but the additional traction helps the 50 jar clobber its rear drive counterpart by 0.7 and 0.6 second in the 60 miles power and quarter mile drags, respectively. The beauty of the competition's X-Drive mode is that it offers the best of both worlds, all-wheel drive for supercar-grade acceleration and decoupling of the front axle to enable a rear drive mode for power oversteer shenanigans. Moving away from the world of dynamic insanity, when the drive modes are left in their softest comfort settings, the M3 Competition X Drive is a livable place for daily consumption. The sharpest impacts reverberate up forged 19-inch front and 20-inch rear wheels and through the $4,500 carbon fiber buckets. The super-supportive seats are somewhat tricky to enter and exit yet provide a surprising amount of comfort.As with all 2023 3 Series, the M3's interior is treated to BMW's curved display that incorporates a 12.3-inch digital instrument cluster and a 14.9-inch touchscreen infotainment system. The iDrive 8 operating system replaces most of the physical buttons for the hack and radio controls with a not-so-intuitive infotainment menu structure. Fortunately, iDrive 8.5 rolls out this summer, and BMW promises to solve these teething issues by improving the layout. Perhaps the fact that this five-seat sleeper returned 27 miles per gallon on our 75 miles per hour fuel economy test is enough to forgive iDrive's shortcomings. More on the BMW M3 starting at $83,595, the M3 Competition X Drive delivers astounding performance for the money. The Edition 50 jar comes standard with a carbon fiber splitter and decklid spoiler, titanium tailpipes trimmed with carbon fiber, M Sport seats, a 50 jar specific carry on suitcase, the executive and parking assist packages, adaptive LED headlights with laser light, wireless device charging, an M shadow line trim, swelling the window sticker to $96,695. The only extra cost options are the aforementioned carbon fiber seats and carbon ceramic brakes. But its time at the top of the 3 Series hierarchy will be limited. The lighter 2024 cubic meters CS with an extra 40 horses and Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 tires arrives in the second half of this year. Whether the CS's $36,100 upcharge is an economically sound decision remains unknown, but it'll certainly contest the throne.